So, punk breaking in 1991. I can't really tell if you guys saw this as a positive thing or a negative thing or if it was just more complex. We were being cynical, but when we saw it, we were being cynical and we didn't really see too much of a future vision with it, even though I think maybe we kind of did. But again, it was before the breakout of Nirvana, so there wasn't any sort of, there wasn't any really big commercial um, punk record that had really cracked into the public mainstream. The title itself is really a joke. Uh, it was a running joke, inside joke during the tour, and uh, yeah, it had more to do with the fact that Motley Crue was actually playing Anarchy in the UK. <laughs> There's two things, it was that, seeing that on, on television when we got over there, and there was, they're showing Motley Crue singing that song in front of this huge European festival audience, and then the fact that we were playing these, these festivals, and there were so many people responding to the music, um, not just us, we had already been over there a few times, and so we sort of had some kind of um, profile. Uh, Nirvana had never been over there, and nobody really knew their music no, at all. No, nothing wrong there. Nirvana was there. But he went over there for there was a sub pop tour. Yeah, yeah. That's true. But again, that was a very sort of, that was a very sort of small club um, thing. And so this was kind of interesting to us to see all this reaction and this response to. Um, to bands like us. I think we were certain, in some way we were ill-prepared because obviously we're being all very flighty and kind of just, you know. Worse than all, I mean, big ones. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, words, yeah, yeah, it's definitely words and all. Kind of Unashamed. Like, the original intention and ambition of this um, film was that it wasn't really going to be a film. Um, it was before there was any um, celebrity, um, currency uh, with Nirvana and when we went on this tour we had asked them to come along and because um, we liked them and and it was um, we asked Dave if, if he wanted to come along with the Super 8 camera and just sort of follow this tour and we were basically I think our intention was just maybe to put together some kind of independent tour video that we would have just had and that we probably would have home video release yeah, yeah like a home video and after the tour, we came home, uh, I think Nirvana went right back to Europe and their record had just come out, um, Nevermind had just come out. And within two months, they, uh, they kind of did what it did. And I know Giffen Records sort of, had, uh, sort of wanted to uh, make a theatrical release of it if they could. And they kind of drove it into a different gear. Um, but it still uh, obviously is a home movie That spilled out of this man's brain on the spot. The intro. Oh, we came in late. I haven't seen this movie in quite a while. I think last time I saw it was the whole stream of consciousness uh, kind of poetry thing where you're kind of dropping references to Bob Dylan, the Fugs, uh, me puppets. Um. Wait, we missed it. I mean, I was just, yeah, it was just bad cerebral cortex expansion. That, you know, I'd like to apologize. I'm sorry. But again, you know, it's it's a good. It's a good uh, 12 years down the road, and we are um, we're, uh, we're adults now. Uh, I mean, the movie's kind of strange and odd, but if you look closely, you'll see some kind of traditional nods to uh, the uh, films of the 1960s, and especially the rock concert films of the 70s, of, uh, you know, which I was trying to pay homage to, trying to be something more like, it had a lot of performance in it, something more like, uh, Song raises the same or something. We didn't realize it. Without a budget, of course. No, we didn't. There was no budget. It was very reckless. I mean, Dave came over with his camera, and I think his camera broke as soon as he came over there. And I there was some concerns. Right. Like, why do we fly this guy over here? And he said, his camera doesn't work. The third day in Dublin, the year my camera broke. Yeah. And so we got a line on a good working Elmo. And I was waiting for us in London. And so we figured by the time we got to London, we'd pick this camera up. So Dave, in a sense, was like, just, he was like dead weight on the tour. He was just like... <laughs> For a few hours. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I shot the whole film with one camera. And I used existing light in the clubs, and sometimes I was kind of dodgy. And uh, Did you use a pogo stick? <laughs> <laughs> After I have to take my drone, you, you know, film I still yeah, have I, all these people in the front row, I know, I know. I mean... <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> 
Like yeah, it was yeah. natural energy. Yeah. No tripods were used in the in the making of this film. <laughs> it's hard to see Super 8 these days. If you want to see, if we shot this film now, Clear Channel would probably own the film. At this point. <laughs> I mean, everybody pretty much tried to get away from Dave and his camera. Um, yeah, I was really... It's pretty much except for me, and I really felt sorry for Dave, because, I mean, Dave and I are, are pretty close, and, and it, I sort of became uh, his, his kind of puppet. He was feeding me lines, or trying to make me improvise, which was always failing miserably. And, and I realized, um, you know, when you're on a tour, et cetera, there's so much peripheral sort of... Um, things going on that you try to sort of escape from anything except for, you know, playing and uh, or eating or something. And so the fact that there's somebody there with a camera trying to get you to sort of do something that's entertaining. And obviously we're having, you know, a hard enough time expending energy just entertaining ourselves, you know, each other. You know, you can see these small dressing rooms and like us and Nirvana, et cetera, just sort of bouncing off the walls and you're just, you know, you're, yeah, you're like, you're smoking bad, Marijuana. Hash. It was, it was, okay. Yeah, I'm just saying uh, marijuana. It was actually hash because you couldn't get marijuana in here. I've heard that Chris Novoselic is kind of embarking on a political career, but I was wondering, watching this movie today, if that scene where he's smoking the hash under the cup is going to come back to haunt him. <laughs> the main, the one thing I like about this movie the most is the way, uh, is the hyper editing of it. I mean, there's so many little clips of that go by that just exist for like two, three frames of like a baby's face. And so when Dave was editing this film, and he was editing it um, here in North Hollywood in the back room of his friend's house. Dave Travis, who's here. Dave Travis, who has... Stand up. Who's uh, there he is. amazingly beneficial to them. Uh, we edited it in the height of Nirvana Mania in 92, so it was kind of weird. It was kind of on being under a microscope. I remember not wanting to include uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit because I thought, oh, you know, we can't have this hit song in this movie. It's just not, you know, it's on MTV all the time. You know, who wants to see my crappy version of it? I don't think we had a really good enough take of that song. You know, I don't like, this whole film was put together with nine hours of footage. And if you could imagine putting together a 98, 100 minute movie just with such limited, uh, you know, footage, uh, you can see how it really was kind of put together in the editing room, this movie, I think. Um, it's all about the editing. When you uh, destroy a bunch of instruments in these shows, what did you do the next night? Did you go to a local guitar store and find some stuff? <laughs> we, we didn't usually destroy them. We actually, um, uh, sometimes we did, we did, unfortunately, but usually the guitars we use are pretty resilient, so uh, you just kind of tape them back together with gaffer tape and go out the next night with them. No, well, Nirvana did destroy, I mean, the first time I saw them, they, 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 they destroyed everything. Yeah, that was the last show. They just rented here, too. And they were in a van, and they had no money, and they were, I asked them, I said, well, what are you going to do about tomorrow's show? And they said they didn't know. <laughs> they completely incinerated everything on stage. <laughs> they these great, there were these great gigs, and, and uh, Nirvana had completely stepped it up. I mean, we had seen, we had played with them in the States a few times, but all of a sudden they had um, Grohl in the band. And um, I remember when we did the first show in, in Ireland, in uh, Cork, and um, that's when we first met Dave, and, the, and he just took the band, and the, the band as a, as a unit really sort of became something special. We've also been sort of in the process of like listening to old records that we've been remastering for like reissues, and it's just, it's kind of a, it, it's, it's kind of scary in a way uh, for me, I don't know. I feel like there's these real short primitive qualities that I can never sort of return to. Um, in some sense I miss, but in some sense I'm glad I'm kind of past as far as development is concerned. Uh, I don't know. That, that movie is kind of, I don't know, maybe it's real sort of intimate with us because it's just so sentimental. I mean, seeing, I mean, you know, seeing a band like Nirvana, we're just sort of, at that point, we're just so uh, incredible, you know, and uh, it's really nice to see that again because it was so much fun. You know, just like, it was so exciting. Or even seeing a brief clip of our friend uh, Joe Cole in the movie, mm -hmm. who, um, <coughs> been dead for 13 years now, which is, you know, seeing Joey Ramone, you know, of course, Kurt, you know, just, you know, yeah. 
It's bittersweet. <laughs> Some of the best stuff was was not in the movie. I mean, it was like every almost every day and all day we kept doing things and saying things when the camera was off that we were just like looking at each other and going, like, God, I can't believe we missed that. And uh, I mean, I remember one day walking off stage, one night walking off stage, and it was a pretty terrible show we had. I think it was pretty dead in the water. And I remember Dave standing there with his camera, and it wasn't on, and Kim just walked up to him and said, like, she was like, that was like a dry hump. <laughs> and you were just, I heard you looking at her going, oh, oh, and like, trying to get you know, say that again. Like, you know, so it was like, it was so, like, devastating. I remember when the Ramones were playing, because we, we all had access to the camera. We had access to sit right in front of the Ramones and the audiences at nighttime. They were just like, the European audience freaking out. That's the whole stage. And I remember we were just sort of sitting there right underneath the stage, so close, and we were just looking straight up. And I think your angle was kind of like that, too. And uh, I just remember we were sitting there, and Kurt, who had never seen the Ramones before, and he was excited that day because they were playing. And uh, I remember him just sitting on the ground, with his legs crossed and his head just down, like he had just sort of like, he couldn't handle it anymore. And he was just like, he was and I remember like hatch. all of us ran, ran across the whole strip there and we just like jumped on him and, and completely pig piled him. And he and your camera was like, you know, sitting on the ground. I was like, that would have been really nice. <laughs> right. Any questions for Jay, perhaps? Question for Jay. He's really talking. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we saw you at the El Rey Open for Evan Dando with Cobra Verde. And I was just wondering if uh, The Fog or maybe Dinosaur Jr. or whatever kind of tour around here again. Oh, uh, I've got no plans right now. <laughs> Any more questions for Jay? Do <laughs> stuff with the Stooges, I think. Jay got kicked out of the Stooges. He got replaced by the original members. <laughs> <laughs> have you made any other projects that we can see? Uh, yeah, I've done, I've done, um, what kind of stuff have you made? I don't know, a lot of stuff. I have a website, wegotpowerfilms.com, and uh, that kind of details my body of work. I've been making films since I was 13 years old. Um, I'm doing a lot of stuff right now. I'm getting all my old films on DVD. That's what I've been kind of working on in the past year. And I, my, the first one, Desperate Change Love Dolls, is out now. Oh, and uh, I have a music documentary film called The Slog Movie coming out. And that's actually a film that was made 10 years pro previous to 91. And it's kind of interesting how, to me, the two films sort of parallel each other in a way. Tell them what it's about. It's a similarly done um, as 91, just, you know, single camera coverage, just me shooting and really capturing these bands playing live in their element in the at the time. Uh, this is for Steve? For all people. Oh. <laughs> Steve, that's one. I thought you said for Steve particularly. Were the Beatles? The, the, one and, of them. The Beatles were, um, yeah, they were very influential. <laughs> 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 oh, we love the Beatles. The Ruddles, too. Yeah. I saw the Ruddles movie last night. How was it? It was the sequel. Yeah. Really? And Wings. <laughs> <laughs> We're not cynical anymore. We have sort of we have embraced the mainstreamization of punk rock. It should be for everybody, and uh, you know we're not judgmental about it. I don't care if it's something that's that you consider real junior or whatever. I mean, it's 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 to us it's a complete success. Okay. Thanks. Kurt. All, right. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. Um, thanks for for uh, slogging with us through this. And uh, thank you. See the gig. All right. Check out the Dave's Wedding movies. They're all really good. They're really good rock and roll movies.